Hello, I'm Jack Rickard with EVTV. We've just completed another successful charge of the Porsche Model 356 Speedster. It's actually a Beck Speedster from Special Editions um, Inc. that uh, we've modified to electric. Had a great drive last night. Took my grandson out to a uh, reading of a friend's uh, new book, Leo the Wise Old Catfish which in typical Southeast Missouri uh, humor form he had at a catfish fry. Uh, my grandson said, ah, why are we eating Leo? Well, it was a beautiful drive on an autumn evening, um, light jackets, and uh, I love that car. We uh, actually shot our Friday show yesterday. Uh, Brian says, uh, throw it in the trash and uh, let's start over. Um, because of uh, kind of a eureka moment we've had here uh, about um, battery charging and battery management systems. I've been at odds with virtually the entire EV community. I'm going to pick on Rich Redmond today, but it's not just him. Uh, all the online forum engineers have typed themselves smart and me out of about four or five cells with a theory of uh, that you have to have a battery management system and you have to actively balance these cells to prevent their destruction. I've had a little difficulty resolving this. We've had this Speedster rolling since last Christmas day. I've put about 5,000 miles on the car. We have no BMS system. I do measure voltages on the cells. We have uh, upgraded it to include more cells. And I did lose a cell in the upgrade uh, by not marrying it into the pack properly. I've been kind of at odds with the community, and we've done very little with this car to actually balance anything. But it runs great. Uh, and in fact, I recently did a 107-mile uh, run in the, in the car, which I pretty much got designed for 85-mile range. But we did do 107 miles. And I wound up with all the cells uh, fairly uniformly between 2.8 and 2.9 volts simultaneously at the end of that run. That's clue number one. Um, and we'll get back to that. I had a conversation, of course, last week we did a big thing on the Manzanita. I had an interesting conversation with Rich Rudman, and I don't want to pick on Rich um, he's a representative, not the, uh, the leader or sole torchbearer for this, but it's what put it in mind most recently and caused some further experiments. My uh, instincts about most things electronic are usually right from the beginning, and it's because I started learning about this stuff when I was a kid, and it's been a long time. Looking at the... Uh, charge and discharge curve of a lithium ion cell, it is very different from battery cells in the past. A lead acid battery has kind of a linear discharge curve that looks about like this from top to bottom. A lithium ion cell has got a very, what I think of as a peculiar discharge curve that looks like this. I don't know if you can see this, but here's your upper voltage where it's charged, and as it discharges, it comes down in voltage very steeply from about 4.25 up here down to about 3.3 volts at the bottom of the steep part of the curve, and it continues to about three points over, three volts over here and below three volts, it just drops off a cliff. Just viscerally looking at this curve, a couple of things come to mind. One is, you don't want to be on either end. <clears throat> Bad things happen when charging because some cells are going to charge more than, than others and, and will arrive at the voltages at different times. The same thing is true on the bottom. So our natural instinct was to avoid overcharging the cells by charging to a lower value than the manufacturer's recommendation. 
4.25 volts, we've charged to 3.75. And we've driven, and that's across the whole pack. And what that means is about 130 volts on our pack here. And so we set that voltage for that and charge to that. And none of the cells, uh, they'll, they'll go kind of all over the place at the end of the charge, but none of them uh, get much beyond 4, 4.1 volts. So there's not enough energy in that steep side. Uh, I'll forfeit a couple of miles. And that's been our theory of battery management. And we haven't included battery management in our car. We don't have it. And I've been driving it successfully for very nearly a year, some 5,000 miles. Uh, and not gingerly, not to the 80% or the 70%. I drove it 107 miles, that's uh, like 98%. And my batteries were still fine. Had a conversation with Rich Redman, and he assured me that they have spent thousands of hours testing these cells, and if I don't get a battery management system, I'm going to lose some cells. Well, in a way, Rich, you're right. I have lost some cells. In fact, I've lost several. Um, but it's not what you think. And in fact, in this show, I have finally, um, not viscerally and not vaguely, but to some uh, definite purpose, figured out what's going on with these batteries and, um, and why we're getting away with murder on our cells and why so many people are having problems with them. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is, uh, these shunt um, charge balancers are actually murdering lithium ion cells. And if you have them, you need to get them off your batteries before you watch the rest of this video. Uh, they're not only dangerous, as I've said many times in the past, they're the problem, not the solution. And we're going to publish this. Again, as always, I could be wrong. I'm not actually, but I could be. And so we're putting this out kind of for peer review and comment. Um, you've cost me a number of cells with all these online forum engineers typing themselves furiously, I got a scratch in my head and digging in my pockets in the back, um, trying to figure out what's going on. And it's led me to some testing and some balancing that has been disastrous. Um, but I finally figured out what's going on. And the shunt balancers uh, are not something you want in an electric car. I've known this all along, but now I know why. And you're going to find this interesting. Um, so let's go over and, uh, and let me show you where we actually test batteries um, and where we started with an electric car purely as battery testing and built an electric car because I got excited over what we found. Let's go back to our beginnings over here. This is uh, my trusty Jimster, a uh, global electric motor car. It's made in Fargo uh, in the Dakotas. Um, they're a subsidiary of Chrysler. Uh, most of the uh, electric car guys laugh at me for these. This is a little neighborhood electric vehicle. Here in Missouri, we don't have to license them. You just buy them and drive them, and they're considered a low-speed vehicle. Supposed to be limited to 25 miles per hour, and um, you're supposed to drive them on streets that are 45 or less. Um, of course, I've got this a little bit hopped up. It'll do about 35, 40 miles an hour. Um, they're not great um, as a car. This one's kind of handy. It has a aluminum pickup truck bed, and we can run up to the Dipsy Dumpster and so forth. Driving it around town, some of the streets in Cape are kind of potholy. I've got big stiff tires on it. They only go about 30 miles on a lead acid pack. And um, they're a little bouncy to ride around in. And of course, in bad weather, they're a little breezy. Um, but I love the little things. They have a seven and a half horsepower motor in them. 